Hi, my name is Kenny Lee, and I'm a hardware engineer on the Quantum AI team. And today I'll be telling you about some of the system performance improvements that we made on our most recent error correction results. So as Kevin mentioned in his talk, one of our main goals was to achieve better error suppression when we increase the system size on our chips. Shown on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see a plot which compares the performance of our distance five logical qubit, which comprises 49 physical qubits, to our distance three logical qubits, which use 17 physical qubits. Now, when you're above the red line in this plot, that means that the larger distance five code is doing better. And when you're below the red line, that means the smaller distance three qubit is doing better. As you can see by the data, when we first started doing these experiments, the additional overhead from adding more qubits outweighed any error correction benefits. However, as we gradually integrated improvements to each component of the error correction circuit, we were finally able to achieve a distance five logical qubit, which outperformed the distance three qubit. So what are the components of an error correction circuit? Let's break it down. Well, there are single qubit gates, such as the Hadamard gate shown here, two qubit gates, such as the CZ gate shown here, and there's qubit measurement, reset, and data qubit idling, as shown here. Before we dive into system improvements, let me give you a refresh on transmon qubits. A transmon qubit is a nonlinear superconducting oscillator. It's formed by a capacitor in parallel with the DC squid, which is formed from two Josephson junctions. This DC squid gives a nonlinearity to the circuit, which gives rise to uneven energy level spacings. We take advantage of this fact, and then we use the two lowest energy states as our qubit states, as shown on the right-hand side in the cartoon. You can see the bottom two energy levels form the computational basis, zero and one. There are also higher energy states, such as two, which give rise to leakage processes. So what does a transmon actually look like in practice? On the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see an optical image of a transmon qubit. The blue cross actually forms the top, top paddle of a capacitor, and at the very bottom of our capacitor, you'll see on, in the inset our DC squid. In addition, you'll notice three other components which are crucial to our circuit. At the bottom, you'll notice that there's a flux bias line. This allows us to tune the frequency of our qubits as we wish. On the right-hand side, there's a drive line, which allows us to deliver microwaves to the qubit to perform single qubit operations. And finally, at the top, you'll see our resonator, which we use for reading out the qubit states. Now that we've refreshed ourselves on the transmon, let's dig into our performance improvements. And we'll start with single qubit gates. So as I mentioned, to perform single qubit gates, we deliver microwave pulses, which capacitively couple to the transmon. And by controlling the amplitude and phase of these microwave pulses, we can enable production of X, Y, Z, or even the Hadamard gate shown in the error correction circuit. Now in reality, when we actually run error correction, multiple qubits are doing single qubit gates simultaneously. And in the ideal case shown here in this little cartoon, each qubit has a designated microwave tone and well-calibrated pulse parameters. Now in reality, due to parasitics in our circuit, microwave drives from one qubit can actually leak over and drive another qubit. So in this cartoon, I've shown you that some of the microwave drive from qubit two is actually weakly coupling and driving qubit one. Now in this situation, you can get simple X, Y, or Z poly errors, but you can also get leakage into non-computational states. This is shown pictorially in the image on the right. If, for instance, the microwave drive frequency of qubit two is close to resonance with the one to two energy level splitting in qubit one, you can drive population from the one state of qubit one into the two state, causing leakage. Now, in practice, we'd like to cancel this out, and what we do is we isolate the particular error, say the leakage, and we measure its magnitude as we apply a cancellation tone to qubit one. To correct for microwave crosstalk, we apply a microwave cancellation tone, and we measure the magnitude of this type of error. And for the right amplitude and phase of our cancellation tone, we can completely null the microwave crosstalk. When we first started our experiments, our single qubit gate error was around 10 to the minus three, with some of our worst outliers at around half a percent error per gate. Now, after we started compensating for microwave crosstalk and accounting for other pulse imperfections, our microwave single qubit gate fidelity increased from 99.9% .9 to 99.92%, and we were able to cut down our worst outlier error by about a factor of two. Now, you might say this is a modest increase in error. However, there are many single qubit gates in this circuit, so the lower we can get this error, the better. 
Okay, now that I told you about single qubit gates, let's move on to two qubit gates. The two qubit gate of choice for us is the controlled Z or CZ gate. If you're not familiar with what a CZ gate does, I've shown you the truth table on the left hand side of this slide. The states 00, 01, and 10 all remain the same. However, the 11 one state picks up a minus sign. Now, in order to do a two qubit gate, you need to introduce some sort of interaction between two qubits. Fortunately, if you simply place two transmonds next to each other, a shared capacitance is formed between them. And through this capacitive coupling, we can actually have a swapping interaction between the two. Now, in today's circuits, we actually introduce additional complexity, which allows us to dynamically tune the strength of this capacitive coupling. Now, this is very important for our optimization of CZ gates. So what, is, what happens during a CZ gate? Well, it turns out if you turn on this interaction and bias both qubits in just the right way, you can get a state-selective frequency shift of the two qubit state 1, 1. And if we tune the strength of this interaction and its duration, we can get the desired minus 1 factor. Now, when you have two qubits, this is a very simple problem. However, in our experiments, we have many qubits all in a grid. So for instance, when you're operating a CZ on a pair of qubits, such as the ones highlighted in red, you can have straight interactions with all of the neighboring qubits, which are highlighted in blue. So what can happen in this particular case? Well, many things, but let me walk you through one particular bad case. So for instance, what if I had a target qubit, which is participating in a CZ, prepared in its state one, and it's adjacent to a neighboring qubit, which is also in its state one. Well, if these two qubits happen to be close to each other in frequency and have a non-zero coupling between the two, they can actually exchange photons, and that can drive the target qubit into the state zero and drive the neighboring qubit into a leakage state two. So our mitigation strategy will be to keep qubits isolated in frequency space and use our tunable coupling circuit to null all unwanted interactions. Now, of course, this is only the case for a single CZ. In the error correction circuit, we're doing many CZs all at once in parallel. So this happens to become a highly non-trivial system optimization problem. And for more details on how we actually do this optimization, I recommend tuning into Sabrina Hong's presentation tomorrow. When we first started our experiment, the average CC fidelity was around 99%. Now, by optimizing for crosstalk, coherence, and control errors, we were able to improve the median CZ gate fidelity from 99% to around 99.6%, a substantial improvement. Now that I've told you about single and two qubit gates, let's take a look at qubit measurement, reset, and data qub qubit idling. During this section of the, of the error correction circuit, we read out and reset our measure qubits, and the data qubits sit idly. Now, in the absence of decoherence, the data qubits will retain the quantum information perfectly. Unfortunately, in real life, we have decoherence. And in particular, noisy fluctuations in the qubit frequency corrupt the quantum phase of the wave function. And so from shot to shot, the block vector can point in many different directions. And as we average over many shots, this manifests itself as additional error. So to move from reality back towards the, to the ideal case, we actually want to do three things. We want to reduce the flux noise of the qubit, we want to reduce the idle time, and we want to reduce our sensitivity to noise. So in order to reduce the flux noise of the qubit, we actually performed an electronics upgrade. In particular, we have a new custom-designed DAC, which provides the flux bias to the qubit. This new DAC reduces the flux noise of the qubit by around 2x in the 10 kilohertz to 100 megahertz frequency band, and additionally mitigates slow drifts in the DC bias. We measured the T2 coherence time of all of our qubits before and after this upgrade and saw a 15% improvement in T2 with the new DAX. In order to reduce the idle time, we actually made a key observation that readout comprises most of the time that we spend doing error correction. In particular, readout takes about 60% of the total circuit length. So to reduce the idle time, we actually sped up measurement from 600 nanoseconds to 500 nanoseconds. And this improved our idle error by around 25%. Now, importantly, due to our new calibration and system optimization protocols, we're able to do this speed up without reducing the measurement performance. Finally, we wanted to reduce our sensitivity to slow flux noise. And to do that, we use dynamical decoupling, or DD. Dynamical decoupling is a sequence of bit flip operations which cancel out phase errors. An example of DD is shown here on the right-hand side of your slide. The effect of DD is actually to filter out low frequency noise, which causes decoherence. So this is shown pictorially on the graph on the right-hand side of your screen. 
When we don't do any dynamical decoupling, represented by the red curve, we see that the qubit response is fairly flat over low frequencies. Now, when we introduce dynamical decoupling, we see a large suppression of low frequency noise. In particular, for this four pulse sequence shown on the previous slide, we see a 30 dB per decade suppression of frequency noise from a few hundred kilohertz down to DC. Finally, we made a very key observation that each qubit has a unique noise environment. So what we end up doing is customizing the DD sequence for each qubit to tailor the filter to its uh, unique noise environment. And when we do this, we see a significant reduction in the logical error rate for a distance five qubit, as shown on the right-hand side. Now, these are only some of the improvements that we made along the way, and I'd like to highlight some other ones that we made. This includes improved outlier detection, faster diagnostics, hardware improvements, and improved calibration and system optimization. And with my remaining time, I'd like to walk you through what we have to do to achieve fault-tolerant error correction. We currently live in the crossover regime of quantum error correction. What does that mean? Well, initially, as we scale up our system size, we'll see a suppression of the logical error rate. However, that only lasts up to a certain point, at which point logical errors will become more frequent. So to ensure that we uh, get an exponential suppression of errors as we increase the system size, we need to improve our component error rates. And in particular, we need to improve them by about three to 10x. However, we believe that with hardware upgrades, improved calibration, and improved system optimization, we can achieve this goal. And I'd like to thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of QSS. Mm -hmm.